Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And it has been a while, hasn't it? I haven't checked out a What If Altis video since March of 2023. It's currently July of 2023, and he's been pretty prolific. He's released a bunch of videos in the meantime. I've been focusing a ton on the Napoleon series and that's a lot of fun. And you don't sit and get uh, frustrated at Napoleon videos, right? Not quite the same vibe. So I figured let's have a look at this one. Now he has quite a few that are out recently, as I said, but this title really caught my eye. It's the secret history of the 20th century. Now I'm very curious where he's going to go with this. He's always great at naming his videos. I'm not going to lie because what path is this going to go here? I'm going to, I'm going to expect the typical what if altists things. I'm going to expect some demographics in here, something about totalitarianism, something about communism. Who knows? Let's check it out. I'm, I'm actually pretty excited for this one. Hopefully it'll be one where I can just sit back and chill and be like, ah, that's some interesting points. Maybe discuss a little bit there and hopefully it's not one that makes me, you know, have to facepalm every 15 seconds or so. They're never that bad. Anyways, if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. We know nothing about the things that we know the most about. Every major religion and mystic tradition says that the truth is hidden inside of paradox. This is since we're too closely attached to the things that happen close to us, and thus it is exceptionally difficult to be unbiased. At the same True. time, we can't see the end result of what these events mean. A Chinese communist premier, when asked what the result of the French Revolution was, replied that it was too early for us to say. Most people view it as a triumph okay. of science and industry in which the average person was rid from poverty and ignorance, however unfortunately punctuated by hateful conflicts that were leftovers from the older age. The world became more rational and enlightened, okay. leaving behind the dark pre-industrial world of religion, racism, empires, and oppression. The real story is very, very different from this. The 20th century was the century of the most rife religious conflict in human history by a vast margin. It was a battle between okay. three separate religions, which fought okay. to the bitter end. I see it was also the century of the most academic lying in pseudoscience ever. Okay, I see where this is going. So he's going to propose that you have Christianity, I'm assuming, then you're going to have fascism and communism as two different as religions. So rather than being, you know, the 20th century is sort of seen as the fight between these three ideologies, though obviously communism lasted far longer than fascism. But it's sort of seen as you have liberal democracy, which during the 1930s, especially in some countries in Europe, was sort of seen as the, the decadent sort of wrong path to lead a country, considering that democracy was introduced to them after the First World War in countries that were created out of their empires, such as um, Czechoslovakia, right now Czech Republic and Slovakia, obviously. Hungary as its own separate nation, Bulgaria also then having political changes, Romania, as well as the Kingdom of Yugoslavia too. Some of these being all new nations that were created out of it. And so it was really seen as fascism as being the new way, right? And communism obviously being a new way to sort of fight against that liberal democracy. So I'm going to I'm going to think that's his hypothesis. The 20th century will be better remembered as the century of pseudoscience than real science. On top of this, this conflict is Don't still being that, fought sure. out today, with the final stages of the humanist wars of religion occurring now. Buckle up for a ride that will completely change your view of modern times. But first, Raid Shadow Legends. Let's see. The humanist wars of religion. At the start of the 20th century, the whole world was changing at an incredibly rapid speed. In Very 1900, yep. you could see cavalry and sabers on the battlefield. And 50 years later, there were nuclear weapons and tanks. He makes a massive point, right? There's sort of a saying that I'm reading in the book now from Hannah Arndt, controversial writer, interesting, very interesting woman though, that, that the 19th century ended obviously not in 1900, but rather in, in 1918, right, or 1914, depending on how you look at it. And he makes a really good point there. The difference, this shift in technology is just monumentous. The Industrial Revolution was reworking civilization, and an Definitely. individual person's daily life changed in almost every way it possibly could. The world's population doubled in 1800 and 1900, yeah. and has more than quadrupled in the time since 1900. The world's rich in irony. 
for humanity as a species, this was the best period ever. The number of humans mm-hmm. skyrocketed to levels no one could have possibly imagined before. Yep. Well, their actual lives became much safer, easier, and prosperous. I mean, even in this picture here, right, the, the fact that you have so many modern medical innovations that happened in the 20th century, right? It's really, I mean, if you look at life expectancy, for example, in Austria, at the turn of the century, the average life expectancy in Austria was, I think, like 45 years, maybe 50 years for men, a little bit more for women. And you compare that to the end of the 20th century where, you know, it's, it's what, probably late 70s, early 80s, I would, just, I would think. However, at the same time, individual humans and countries, or whole regions of the world, lived through some of the worst periods ever in human history. Mm-hmm. The horrors of the Holocaust, Stalinism, Maoism, or the trenches of World War I are yep. things that previous Definitely. generations could not even have dreamt up in their nightmares in border upon hell on earth. Yeah, the rap- definitely. And I mean, the famines as well, right? The Indian famine, some of the famines that swept through the world, the holodorm, that's a whole other thing. Um, you know, and obviously the the tail end of imperialism too, right? The ch- The scramble for Africa and seeing really the effects of that and seeing the colonialism was, you know, and imperialism overall was really not the path forward. I would annex the planets if I could, said Cecil Rhodes. And so seeing the transformation of that really was, he makes a really good point here. It was a completely transformative century. I don't know if you can say that about any other century. Rapid changes inherent to industrialization and globalization broke collective understandings of the world, which created what amounted to giant mental health pandemics, those being totalitarian ideologies. Sure. This ironically occurred right after humans got rid of actual pandemics on a large scale. There's a very good (laughs) book named The True Believer by Eric Hoffer. It was written in the 40s and talked about the psychology that leads to totalitarian movements. Hoffer describes a freedom from freedom. We humans need psychological stability in a terrifying world. This comes from our... This comes from religions, community... I swear, I like this has happened in so many videos. I'm swear I'm the only one that notices this. Is like he'll have multiple takes of the same sentence. Ah, whatever. Families, whatever. ethnic identities, and other forms of group identity, which we can rely on when our own mortality as individuals is too terrifying. When the world's too much, people follow radical political ideologies to give their lives some direction, meaning as well as shared community with shared values. Sure. Okay. With the breakdown of the old social world, which did not just occur in industrial countries, but also in what we now call the developing world due to colonialism, yep. we saw large populations who lost any religion or other social forms to give them meaning in life, as well as the destruction of traditional village communities and family structures. It resulted in people fleeing into what really amounted to as cults. Cults have existed since the dawn of human history. They were often pretty powerful as well, with the cult of Mithras, the Gnostics, Freemasons, and others being some examples. Mm -hmm. However, they were largely elite minority organizations which controlled society through indirect influence. By cult, I mean an organization with a set hierarchy, rituals to enter through which, and common ideological goals built around shared beliefs, with the leaders benefiting disproportionately. The National Socialist and Communist Party of China fit all the definitions of a cult. However, at this point, the cult takes over the whole society. You can tell a good religion from a bad religion, based as it sounds, since the first is... I I don't know that... I can't quite point it out right now because it's obviously an on-the-spot thing, but is, is a regime like Mao's China, Stalin's Russia, Hitler's Germany a cult? I don't know. It doesn't quite sit right on me, but let me know what you think. After more thought, I might be like, yeah, okay, that would make more sense. It doesn't quite sit right, though. Let me know what you think below, though. Abstract moral standards that it can hold itself to. Well, the latter... Yeah, funny about that. Even when they cut a deal with with Soviet Russia, they had to actually uh, backpedal on a lot of their propaganda. Um, It was crazy when, I think it was in in 1939, when the deal was struck that you had the international that was played in Nazi Germany, right, during the... um, during one of the, uh, the, the the delegations to Soviet of Soviet Russia to Nazi Germany, and they played the international Wahnsinn. Self-servingly adjust its moral code to whatever its self-interest is at that given time. 
Also, a good religion is capable of establishing boundaries for what it is and is not capable of doing, while a false religion claims that it will fix everything at no cost to the follower. You're not being spiritually conned if your religion tells you that your life is going to be hard, but if you learn to humble yourself, it can be a bit more bearable. A false religion tells you that there is hidden truth that suddenly has been revealed, and when all agree to that hidden truth, we'll live in a utopia. An important part of this okay. is that for all these ideologies, as people join them to subliminate their anxieties around life, and that doesn't actually happen, that ideology is spread to try to control every aspect of human life due to their obsession with power. A good ideology is capable of seeing beauty and truth in the world. A false one only sees through power and sees the only thing stopping it from reaching a utopia is its lack of complete power over everything. In the early 20th century, hmm. or a period really of unbridled growth, Good it had point. appeared as if humans had conquered nature and were close to breaking the code that would allow us to live in a utopia. All three of these ideologies follow something called the technological project. Or the idea hmm. that by using technological progress and social engineering, the human race can reach a utopia. Remember this point since it's going to become the most important thing for the end of this video. The world in 1913 was largely the same that it existed at the Congress of Vienna 100 years before when Napoleon was defeated. Rightly so. That was the point of the Congress of Vienna, was to really put that stability in Europe. Right was to not have another Napoleonic figure that would come through and basically conquer all of mainland Europe or a massive chunk of it, right? And that it was meant to keep the peace, the balance of power, right? That Metternich, for example, really based his entire life and career on was to have that balance of power. It was a world with large European colonial empires, mm -hmm. almost at the imperial. Oh man. I'm just getting to the part in the, the book of the origins of totalitarianism on, on imperialism. And I, I won't totally get into it here. It's quite a long, maybe I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll do another video on that. But um, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. The links between the imperialism that we saw during this period and the absolute, you know, chaos and war hunger, so to say, that we saw in the, in the mid of the century. Every state in the world was a monarchy, or very recently a monarchy, well, or one of the aristocracy. Indeed, Farming was still done largely with hoes and plows, and almost everyone would be what we would call a religious fiction, fanatic right? today. The historian Niall Ferguson makes an interesting point that if you traveled around the world a hundred years ago, and you just look at what people wore, it would be incredibly diverse between the cowboys of the Old West, the shawls of Eastern Europe, how Breton peasants dressed, the Chinese top knot or Indian saris. Now all their great grandkids are wearing t-shirts. Things were yep. only the same right on Good the surface. Point. Beneath it, as said before, the world was coming to grips with colonialism and industrialization. Lenin liked to say history either happened glacially slow or like lightning, that there are hours in which decades worth of history take place. And if anyone True. in history would know that, Lenin would. Our current era is one of those moments in history in which decades of history have built up and now will be spent in the next couple years. World War I was very similar. Western civilization had spent a thousand years building up the nation's honor, religion, and cultural foundations to get young men to happily die in the hellish trenches of World War I. At mm. the end of the war, Everyone a lot to be said about that, actually. stood both literally and metaphorically shell-shocked, completely unable to deal with the world they grew up with as children no longer existing. Every single country that lost World War I saw a regime change and the collapse of liberalism. Start he, makes a, he makes an amazing point, actually. He's completely right in that, right? And that the world, you know, as I said just a couple minutes ago, the end of the 19th century was really in 1914 or 1918, depending on how you look at it. Right. But that was really the end of that century. And that, yeah, the world that then was inherited after the Great War was not at all the same. Right. And I, I think you can say that also about the Second World War. I can't think of any event off the top of my head, of course, just sitting right here off the top of my head that would also register in that sort of level. But let me know what you think below. Maybe seven years war, 30 years war, 100 years war. Anyways. Starting in the 20s, we saw the ideological scramble for people who tried to explain the horrifying traumatic suffering 
that the whole world faced through either World War I or True. communism. Yep. This process also occurred in the developing world as colonialism had wiped out all of the previous cultural trajectories. Mm -hmm. Starting in the 20s, we saw the ideological scramble of people who were trying to explain the horrifying traumatic suffering that the whole world was facing either through World War I or communism. The battle for the hearts of the world had begun. I mean, I don't, I mean, I understand what he's saying with communism, but I, okay, anyways, we'll, we'll keep going. The three factions. All right. Let's see if my hypothesis is Three worked. ideologies came Boom, out to my fight over the world my for the century was after World War I. Those being liberalism, Marxism, and fascism. Liberalism was the only one of these ideologies that was in power before World War I mm -hmm. and was partially invalidated by being blamed for the war. Sort of like a video game, we'll talk about the strengths okay. and weaknesses of each major ideology, which thus help determine the end outcome. In my video on family structure, I explain how you can Go use check family out, structures to, to accurately too. predict what kind of ideology societies went for in the 20th century. This is since families imprint what intuitively seems fair in a culture, since people grew up with it. As the peasants gained political power, they tried to replicate their families through politics. The exogamous clan, with countries like Russia, China, Cuba, or Yugoslavia, okay. went for communism. The patrilineal family, with nations like Spain, Germany, or Japan, went for fascism. The nuclear family, with the English speakers and the French as examples, stayed liberal. Yeah, I already went over that in that reaction video that I did to that, so I'm not going to talk about those points because I don't entirely agree with them. Go check out that video. I'll leave a thing in the top right here. Modernity struggles massively with tunnel vision or ability to see context. The way our logical systems work is that we say reality is the things we can scientifically prove. And if you can't scientifically prove it, it just doesn't exist. However, then we only research the things we want to think about. Okay. This is all how these sure. ideologies sure. propound what is really pseudoscience. At the same time, the modern world looks for a single principle, whether freedom, race, or class, and tries to explain all human relations through it, which has to fail since the world is infinitely complicated. For anything over their lives making policies based off science. I, can't, I, I mean, I get what he's trying to say, but don't you think that there were a lot of policies that were based off, you know, egalitarianism or other sort of ideological things that aren't exactly science? I mean, like, I kind of get what he's trying to say. This more and more equalism, but with horrific inefficiency. Yeah, of course, that's the conservative bend for you. And side effects. I mean, eh, okay. An example of this kind of oh logic boy, here we go. is our views on race or gender today. The literal argument for a gender spectrum or why men or women don't have differences between them is that first, there are cultural expectations around gender. Thus, gender is a cultural construct. Cultural Get back to the history. Don't exist since we Come made them on. Up, and thus, gender doesn't exist either. The same arguments used for race. I've taken a full course of gender studies, and I've read thousands of pages on this topic, and you can reference James Lindsay if you want to know more. However, this argument that everything is a cultural construct, thus cultural constructs don't exist, has literally been used by postmodernists to say that reality doesn't <sighs> exist, and we can edit reality for whatever we want, which is insane. This is such a weak argument since it's so easy to find mountains of evidence irrefutably proving the differences mentally or physically between men and women in many different ways. Although you can argue at how much it affects things like intelligence or personality, there is no one in the sciences of any political position who argues that biological race is not a real thing today. However, Okay, people have asked me about my views on this stuff before, and honestly, like, I'm not, I'm not really terribly into hyper-modern politics-type stuff. I'm far more interested in history and what happened before, and honestly, like, I, I just don't care. You know, <laughs> like, it's just, I just don't care. For, for decades, this these stuff. topics were... Ta I've talked about my experience in university before, and again, I went to business university, so it was different, but... I mean, to say that, you know, whatever. I'm not getting into the culture war, man. To study, we just refuse to look into them, thus meaning people could say they didn't exist. I mean, I mean, one thing, though, is like races of the world. is like Europeans are a race, right? I mean, like you, you have people that are... <sighs> Anyways, you know what I'm trying to say. I don't want to get into this. 
even though every era of history thought it was completely <laughs> Middle East. <laughs> okay. Obvious Middle that they because. existed before. This is how every side of the political compass has gone through a phase of saying that its values are the scientific truth, since it just researches things that validate their pre-existing assumptions, thus resulting in science becoming a mirror for its beliefs. In his book The Master and His Emissary, McGillchrist talks about how neurologically these ideologies are dependent upon the left brain, which are incapable of seeing the world through any lens except power, and see- Isn't the left brain, right brain thing complete bull? Like, isn't it? I, I don't know. I might be wrong. No truth, love, I heard it was kind beauty. of like suicide. Also, its views are incorrect Pseudo against the right brain itself. when tested, which does all of the things above. But the left brain is always completely confident in its worldview, while the right brain is capable of seeing nuance in its own failures. Again, I might in be In summary, the wrong. left brain is a worldview without meaning, purpose, beauty, truth, love, and everything else that can't be autistically, mechanically proven. The left brain is a worldview in which the only things that are assessed are money and power. One of the things McGill- Wait, what? So the left brain is something that can only be assessed through money and power. It uses logic detail. Okay. But why? What? I'm not- Huh? I'm not making this- Okay. All right, I might- Brain is a worldview in which the only things that are assessed are money and power. What but then, again, can't a logic also be used to assess egalitarianism, right? And other things like this, like is it exclusively a power lens thing? Is it an exclusively a might is right type thing? One of the things McGillchrist says, and this is incredibly true of our time today, is that the left brain is simultaneously incredibly cynical because it doesn't believe in anything except money and power, but it's also incredibly gullible because it's incapable of looking at context. And modern art's just a great example of that because the artists are all like, I'm so original and perfect. And then they put out absolute garbage and our society is so gullible we just don't call them on their bluff and say your art is terrible. In Jungian psychology, there's this idea that you need to grow out your shadow side or the traits that you are weakest at and naturally repress in order to be able to fully develop as a person. My dominant Jungian function is the hermit slash magician and my shadow is the <laughs> Okay, explorer. all right. Thus to become okay. my full version, I need to travel, take risks, go on adventures to reach a balance with my hermit who just wants to stay at home and read. Jung, I got to admit, like Jung is quite an interesting... He's quite an interesting character, obviously, but I uh, I get it. This is all very popular because of Jordan Peterson and all that stuff. And again, as I've talked about in other videos, I was there at the original thing that made him famous, that stupid blow up thing with the Jigglypuff or whatever that what, smugly puff or whatever. But again, it's I don't know. It just doesn't quite sit right. But maybe it's just not my main interest, to be honest. However, this is also true of ideologies. Each of these like it sounds like to me it sounds like Myers Briggs types thing. I ideologies know. need I might something be totally else wrong. to balance themselves out. None of them ever achieved that though. Again, this is which is why all of these ideologies died. Of all these ideologies, communism is the worst constructed. I have a full video explaining this topic. However, communism is naturally the most removed from the human condition. Communism assumes progress will always occur no matter what, that humans are naturally good, that we can socialize humans to be whatever we want, or the blank slate, that class and economics are the only lens through which history operates, that humans are equally talented, that men and women are the same, that metaphysical ideas or standards do not exist, that we are completely destined to form a giant global classless society. All of these are wrong, though. Every single one of these has been objectively proven to be incorrect. The reality is humans are inherently self-serving, unequal, religious, divided by nationality, sex, are biologically programmed by genetics, and progress or wealth are inherently rare against the historic norm of poverty and stagnation. However, understanding these two points show the implicit point of communism and its greatest strength, its seductiveness. Communism offers an incredibly enticing worldview for a large part of the population. It literally posits okay, the happiest- All right, now I can get back to it. ...and most self-serving view of the human condition you could possibly have. It tells people if they kill the rich, the group most people hate, that they will face no struggle and live in a utopia or heaven on earth. Communists are also incredibly effective at using language. This is partially due to how emotionally palatable communism is 
But also, the communists tend to recruit the wordsmiths or chattering classes in a society, like academics or artists, who are most articulate. In a war of letters or propaganda, the communists will always win. However, to rope back to the Jungian point, communism's big advantage also leads to its weakness. Communism sounds on paper, must be balanced with how brutal the reality is. It's alright. Communism has been tried dozens of times in every climate, civilization, and continent over the last century, so we know this is a feature, not a bug. Since communist societies abdicate responsibility on every single social level, it naturally falls to an autocratic leader. Communists always say that the perfect conditions of real communism weren't met, but if your ideology is tried that many times and fails each time and needs absolutely perfect conditions, it's just a bad ideology because the world's never going to be perfect. We even see this... I mean, again, like, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Like, this is pretty... Of course, right? Any totalitarian society does not work in the end, right? And you have communism as an ideology. Communism as an ideology, right, is different from Marxism in and of itself. Marxism is, is obviously has quite a successful critique of capitalism. I think it would be unfair to say that Marxism is not a good critique of capitalism. Fair enough. But is it the system that we should be living under? Is it the right way? No, obviously, right? The, 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 the point is, is that totalitarianism, whether it's installed through any sort of ideology, is not good for not only the system of people, not only the system, but also the people that are living underneath it, right? In the pre-modern world, where societies that were economically communist, or those who had no market since the state ran everything, were all brutal theocratic autocracies. Examples include the Inca Empire, Ptolemaic Egypt, and partially Jesuit Paraguay. In all of these cases, sharing and caring really turned to the elites treating the population <laughs> as de facto slaves, whipping them to work which is what happened in our communist societies. Communist societies can't incentivize people through money, which is what the market does. They incentivize them through force and hierarchy. Force and sure. the market are the only two ways we've been able to incentivize people over history. The communist societies that work best are those that are theocracies with extremely strong religions, thus creating- But you can't be a communist with a, what? Wait, what? Say that again. Work best are those that are- th is we've been able to incentivize people over history. The communist societies that work best are those that are theocracies with extremely strong religions. But again, you can't have a communist country without, with, while also being a theocracy. The point of communism is to completely get rid of religion, right? So that doesn't really make sense. Thus creating social pressures to work. Next comes liberalism. As okay, and again, like that's a pretty, uh, I was expecting him to go a little bit deeper there, right? But again, it's, it's a pretty fucking, you know, yes, communism bad, I know, we get it. But like, I wanted uh, at least a little bit more depth there other than like, bro, it doesn't work. Look, it's never worked. We're, humans are greedy, bro. You know, I don't really think that's a secret. Anyways, whatever. Said before the oldest of the three main ideologies, stemming back in some form to at least the 1600s. At the time of World War I, every major country in <laughs> Sorry, Europe Nicholas. had liberalized to some degree, even Tsarist Russia or Habsburg Austria. True. Liberalism was widely considered to be the future. The combination of the Enlightenment, liberalism, and Christianity were seen as the trinity that would rule the world before World War I. World War I, for the longest time, looked as if it invalidated liberalism, which was fighting a defensive war for much of the rest of the century. Liberalism posits a vision of the world built off individual freedom, whether the right to own guns, property, or vote. Mm -hmm. Liberalism's great strength is its flexibility. Liberal societies see the fastest economic growth are incredibly inventive and have high social trust. On its face side, liberalism's strength is its looseness. Liberalism's weakness is that it isn't a religion. Communism and fascism mm -hmm. offer broad visions of the world that promise glory or utopia. Liberalism just says, you know, freedom's nice. This is added to the feeling prevalent among fascists and communism that liberalism is weak and decadent. Since liberalism offers no yeah. religious view of the world, which humans need, it means that liberalism cannot survive without Christianity or sometimes other traditional religions. Again, it's not that it... <sighs> Again, it's not that liberalism in itself cannot survive without re religion, right? It's to say that... 
again, it goes back to this debate, and I swear I've talked about this before, is whether you need to have an ideology to find meaning, right? If meaning and ideology are two of the same coin. I think what if Altus would argue that meaning is derived from ideology in and of itself, no matter what it is, whether it's, you know, fascism, communism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever it is, right? And to say that liberalism, this is a pretty classic critique of it, is that it, as it being a godless nation, right, a godless ideology, in that itself is that it doesn't drive people to meaning. But I mean, you can look at, um, obviously, if you can say the decline of religion in the past couple of decades, and you can see that the difference in economic productivity is, if you want to use that measurement, and of course, there's lots of other measurements to use, then you can obviously say that liberalism in and of itself is strong enough to be able to increase human welfare and satisfaction. Liberalism is an outgrowth of Christian philosophy, which prioritizes the individual soul yeah. and human agency. True. When Christianity goes into decline, as we'll see later in this video, liberalism morphs. See, and that's the thing. Without belief, and again, this is just like I've seen these points from lots of other sort of. I don't. I don't even know what I call them. Christians not scholars you know what i mean you know the types right without belief in god people always lean towards man-made stability like authoritarianism or the nanny state that's just like the most conservative conservative talking point i've heard without belief in the soul people start thinking that the ends justify the means thus allowing horrifying totalitarian regimes that killed more than any other religion in history and again it's making these really large assumptions that okay without god there's there's nothing but chaos and disorder Right. And it sounds a lot like, honestly, it sounds a lot like like Jordan Peterson. <laughs> and I mean, I went to his Bible lectures. I literally like I went to them in Toronto in person. I bought the ticket and everything. And while I understood his point, it was an interesting point to see. I don't exactly agree that without a belief in God, that there's just nothing but chaos. I met a guy on a plane who was who was Muslim and we were chatting about this pure recommendation not the best topic you know don't talk about religious ideologies on a plane you can't go anywhere in case the conversation goes bad but thankfully it went well and he said the same thing right is that without that belief there's nothing to look forward to there's nothing else to and it's like okay fine but we have large sections of society you have lots of countries even in europe where the majority population is either atheist due to their history particularly in eastern europe right and it's the same thing where you can look at that and see that, yes, you can still be a happy person and you can still um, have a functioning society that is good for the people without religion. And it's something completely indistinguishable from its original position. All right. It's like it ignores that people normally act as groups, look for company and sex, thus atomizing society. Again, like I don't see how it ignores that people normally act as groups liberalism. And again, with the family structure that he talked about before with the nuclear family, being one of the keystones of liberalism, I believe that's what he um, what he what he um, um, what he pointed to as a claim in his family structures ideology video. I don't really see that. Again, I might be remembering that wrong, but I this don't is really understand in that. many ways since liberalism is an individualist ideology, while the other two are collectivist and religions like. But again, it's not always just that one divide, right? Individualism can also be within your family unit. Right. And some people would say that is collectivist. And, you know, please write a comment down below. I'd be happy to discuss. But saying that it's just one or the other. OK, well, liberalism is only for the individual and no one else. I don't really think that's true. Christianity and others establish an idea that God will take care of you. And if you have faith in God, that's what you need. But once you remove that, people get terrified. and They want a collective to take care of them. And as you'll see, this is what happened with liberalism. Also, since liberalism pushes for, so wait, you'll see this is YouTube video. Yeah, you did. <laughs> well, freedom. If Maybe it's, it's extended too video. far, it ends up eroding the entire society as it becomes atomized. And fascism and communism both maintain group cohesion through force, which liberalism cannot. The final ideology is fascism. Fascism, in some ways, the opposite of communism. Sure. It's the opposite. I mean. They're two ugly sides of the same coin, I would say. In that communism takes the more rose-tinted view of the human condition, removed what? from reality. Fascism, meanwhile, fascism makes doesn't. the brutal belief that life is a Darwinistic battle for survival, in which one should try to evolve to a higher level. 
well, humans are genetically unequal, this okay. view of the world is largely accurate, but holy shit, that's bleak. Fascism is the closest to human nature, but it's also incredibly ugly and brutal. The thing is that... Yeah, and again, the other thing too is that it's it's <laughs> it presupposes that a lot based on race, right? And that's a huge difference is that you have the racial ideology that was really important too, talking about the 20th century and everything, getting back to the topic, is that during the turn of the century and in the 19th century too, you had a lot of race-based so-called science, as he would also say is pseudoscience, which, hey, fair enough, right, that really reinforced that ideology of fascism, right, is that especially in Germany, though obviously not as much in Italy, is that there was a lot of that racial-based ideology, and even the Italians had it too. That's completely realistic, since that's a pretty apt description of almost every pre-industrial country. Unlike communism, the fascist states had functional economies and were some of the wealthiest <laughs> nations in the world, alongside fighting far above their weight class. I mean, Nazi Germany was practically broke before the war broke out, right? And it had to obviously, it basically had to declare war. This is already getting long enough. We're at 35 minutes. I'm not even halfway through the video. But point is, Wages of Destruction, go check out that book. Really, really great deep dive into Nazi Germany's economy. Yes. Fascism is the most masculine, and you see problems from this in that fascist bureaucracies and militaries okay. are often pretty incoherent <laughs> because everyone is such a massive... Ob im Glück oder im Glück, ob in der Freiheit oder im Gefängnis, ich bin meiner Fahne, die heute des Deutsches Reiches Staatsflagge ist. So what it says is that whether in happiness or unhappiness, whether in freedom or in prison, I, I am my flag, right? Meaning the, the Nazi flag here, that today is um, the state flag of the German Reich. Ego and these societies push heroism and pride. For example, in Nazi Germany, each branch of the bureaucracy and military acted independently from all the others, which made a kind of crazy and inefficient system. But again, a lot of that was due to so, what was sort of the interesting way of power structures that would work, especially for the Nazi regime, is that you would, he, like Hitler would, and not just Hitler, but this was sort of how it was structured in a way, is that you would have two competing ministers for the same portfolio, right? And the idea was for them to basically hash it out and for the best one to come through, right? And although these administrations not talking to each other, I don't know if that's strictly true. I don't know enough about the organizational structure to say if that's true or not true, but I see, wait, one by government officials and one by the party officials. The system benefit typo, no one and made everything more confusing, but again, the party officials and the government officials. Of course you would have separate entities because the party in and of itself was a functioning body outside of the state as it had remained, right? The party needed to be independent from the state itself. He acted independently from all the others, which made- But again, it's also like in other systems too, it's the same thing. A kind of crazy and inefficient system. In Imperial Japan, the military commanders would act independently from their superiors, so certain colonels would just attack foreign countries. Or military guys would assassinate politicians they didn't like, and the population was just supposed to support them because they were being very manly and heroic. Again, I don't know <laughs> these being very manly, but I mean, like, it was obviously thought that they were... Again, I don't know as much about Japan, unfortunately. It is one of my blind sides, is that I'm not as familiar with it as the authoritarian regimes in, 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 in uh, Italy and Germany. But again, <laughs> I think it was thought, also another typo, uh, that, uh, that uh, obviously they were saving the nation, not just like being manly. In this way, communism and fascism are the opposites because fascists had a very decentralized command structure where local commanders could disobey orders, while communism had the exact opposite, where there are stories from Soviet Russia where there's an error in the command systems which tell army units to walk into the middle of a river, and they do it even if it results in them drowning because if they don't follow the orders exactly right, they'll all get shot. The problem yeah and i mean that's that plays more of a part into is that the the wehrmacht heavily resisted particularly during the war point the pressures that came in from obviously the nazi party they definitely collaborated it's not like the wehrmacht was i'm not perpetuating any clean wehrmacht myth garbage here but 
the power structures that were in place, the fact is, is that you didn't, the army was not entirely, I don't want to mix words here because it could be taken out of context, but you have to understand that the different power structures between the Soviet army and the Soviet government were obviously different than the power structures between the Nazi government and the and the Nazi state, right? For example, the purges is not something that happened in Nazi Germany, right? To my understanding, barring maybe a few examples, there was no large purge of military officers in the same way that happened in the Soviet Union due to ideological reasons. Problem with fascism. It Italy, probably not either. Is that since it keeps things so sociopathically real, it has no moral code, which makes it completely untrustworthy. When you know someone has no moral standards, they're really a threat. This is why fascism was the ideology which lost since everyone else in the world allied against the fascist states. And well, I mean, they also fucking declared war on everyone. Crushed them into the ground for being too dangerous. Fascism. Yeah, they declared. Huh? Fascism needs some kind of moral structure to judge itself. But hold on, let me see if I understood him correctly, because I don't just want to be make a straw man. Everyone has no moral standards, they're really a threat. This is why fascism was the ideology which lost since everyone else in the world allied against the fascist states and crushed. But again, the fascist states declared war on everyone else, and the liberal states, right, if you want to call them America, um, America, UK, France at the time, the liberal states, appeased the fascist states in hope of continuing peace in Europe. Push them into the ground for being too dangerous. Fascism needs some kind of moral structure to judge itself against, or a religion. Fasc yeah, and again, it, uh, fascism okay. is most similar to the pre-axial age states like Assyria or Chin. The problem with these states and why they fell is sure. that no one liked them since they were completely immoral. Thus, everyone teamed up to wipe them off the face of the earth. Again, I don't know anything about those ancient societies. I'm not going to sit here and lie. But again, the fascist state, it's very clear. Fascism could not, this is going to be a fucking long video. Fascism could not survive without the ideology of war, right? Without that incoming, without the constant need for expansion, right? The constant need for it and the willingness to commit violence in the name of the state, right? And liberal ideologies did this as well, obviously through colonialism and imperialism. They had the, there was no, the, the, the fascist society in Nazi Germany would have collapsed if not for that expansion. In the interwar period, the world became split into liberal, Marxist, and fascist blocs. Before the war, the whole world's economy was struggling, and to deal with this, each of the ideological blocs started to use more state planning. Plans world War II deals. was partially Wrapped informed in by trains. how the fascist states were dangerous, Chains. given they were openly aggressive, but also just by geographic position. Germany was in the middle of the map, making them the logical base for a large alliance structure against them. Japan was also surrounded what? by weak Germany's always been in the middle of the map. What? Weak entrenched powers on all sides. We all know what happened next. The liberal and communist worlds teamed up to destroy the fascist in the bloodiest war in history. They then divided it up, and afterwards came the Cold War between liberal and communist worlds. If the Nazis hadn't been fascist, or even a less racist brand of fascists, which is again a sign of how low trust fascism is, again, it's just throwing around fa- okay, hold on. They would have easily won World War II. <laughs> Again, again, now it's just getting into like, man, man, really? Yeah, okay, so if the Nazis hadn't have been the Nazis, they would have won World War II. Like, th this is sounding like some Hoi 4 stuff now at this point. Fact of the matter is, the f I think the most plausible alternative history thing is that, fine, you take away the Nazi party, you have a very, very conservative government in Germany probably would have, for example, annexed Austria, but I don't think would not have gone as far as Hitler did. When the Nazis made the Soviet Union, lots of ethnic minorities like the Ukrainians cheered them on, but then when- it Again, because the, Ukra <laughs> because the Ukrainians were obviously targeted, right, by the Russians at this point, Holodorm, hello, you know, um, and so they were seen as the, the liberators from uh, communist, uh, from Stalin's regime.
became clear that the Nazis wanted to genocide them. They didn't get their support anymore, but they very easily could have raised armies in the million from Eastern Europe against the Soviets. Yeah, and they did. At the same time, there were there were massive brigad, uh, brigades, almost a brigada. There were massive brigades, right, of volunteers from the East that fought against the communists, right? So to say it's in the millions, I don't know. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but certainly tens of thousands of men volunteered. Even people in Norway volunteered, right? You had Dutch divisions, you had Belgian divisions, you had, you had Vichy France as well, and people that willingly signed up for it. Jews fleeing the Axis countries gave the Allied world immense scientific breakthroughs that the Axis could have used if they weren't so anti-Semitic. And the Nazis <laughs> were using True. tremendous amounts of their energy to kill the Jews at exactly yes. the time of war when they needed that to fight the Russians. In short- I'm very glad he said that because that's, that's one of the things that's quite fascinating is that the Nazis, if you wanna win a war, you don't spend a ton of manpower and resource. You literally destroy manpower, right? and you destroy resources for the sake of extermination, right? And that's why it's impossible to, divor to divorce the ideology that the Nazis had. They didn't, they wanted to win the war, but look at the priority structure. It was a war of ideology. It was a war to destroy what Hitler saw as the Jewish Bolshevik um, ideology on Europe. Nazism is a big reason the Germans lost World War II. Mm -hmm. The aggression and ego attached to fascism was in many ways a dooming factor. For example, Hitler attacked Russia when he was still fighting Britain and where it would have made sense to finish off Britain since he would have his never, racial- Again, he would have never been able to finish off Britain anyways. The only way that you can get a seaborne invasion of UK. Now you're talking about in like Hoi Four terms, right? So come on doctrine demanded that he conquer Eastern Europe as yeah. fast as possible. The Japanese also lost World War II in part due to fascism because if they had just kept fighting in China and then attacked Russia- Wait, 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 wait. Repeat that one more time. As fast as possible. The Japanese also lost World War II in part due to fascism because if they had just kept fighting in China and then attacked Russia, while the Germans did, they would have won the war and kept their empire. However, due to ego struggles between the Navy and the Army, in which the Navy won, they attacked America instead, which <laughs> yeah. blew up their entire empire. In all of these cases, the irrational, unthinking aggression that came from fascism ended up destroying yes. their societies. Yes, Aristotle exactly. said that ideologies that died I totally the final with. extension of their logic, or their greatest strength becoming their greatest weakness. Yeah. In fascism, they said they would die for their honor, on their own swords in a blaze of glory. They, they got did. their wish. For communism, they said they'd kill the rich and destroy private property, which also killed them. The liberal but again, there's also that, that dying by the sword. Um, I wouldn't say it's a direct tenet of the ideology, but obviously you have the nationalism that's thrown in there as well, which I think sort of nationalism in a way, I think sort of can be the common denominator through any ideology. Push for personal freedom, which was their end. The greatest atrocity in world history was also occurring in the Marxist bloc. Somewhere downwards of 100 million people died in completely self-inflicted atrocities. The collectivism of agriculture killed 50 million people mm. around the world by yep. itself, yep. since communist agriculture just didn't work. As I True. always say, Very human societies system. are living beings, and Marxists treat them like machines where they can just cut gears out and edit at their own free will. In the Soviet Union, for example, the centralized government killed the nobility, church, merchants, independent farmers. <laughs> they tried to kill the church. They didn't really do it. Sexuals, artists, most of the communist leadership or any organization that could provide leadership independent from Stalin. Cultures yep. can spend thousands of years building up human capital, and communists killed it all in a matter of decades. People say communists industrialized countries, and that's often true, but they did so at the cost of hollowing out their entire society. Yep. Let's look at Russia before and after communism. We have computer models that show that under the czars, productivity grew rapidly, while under the communists, it grew through larger inputs. If the trends under the czars continued, Russia could possibly be the greatest economy in the world, with a population larger than America. At the same time, before World War I, Russia was a military, cultural, intellectual titan, and after it, it was none of those. Mm, Alternately, let's go— I don't know if I would call it a titan. 
I wouldn't be so sure about that. But okay. China to every other cynic Confucian nation that went with capitalism, whether Japan, Korea, or Taiwan. However, that's comparing China after it adopted capitalism. When China was really communist, under Mao, it had a total economy smaller than Spain's. Communism was the best thing that ever hmm, that happened true? to America, hmm. since it socially hollowed out the two countries that could have been our rivals due to technical ability and sheer size, that being Russia and China. The Cold War was in effect the process of the communists and liberals looking for allies in the post-colonial world. What happened in most cases was that military dictators of tribes tried to pretend to either be liberal or Marxist in order to get money or weapons. However, yeah. if you look at countries in Africa, some tribes- That's interesting actually that he put, he put Tito as being more, I'm assuming this is more the, the, the light blue being more Western aligned. He put Vietnam as more like slightly Okay, interesting anyways. Exist ...in order to get money or weapons. However, if you look at countries in Africa, some tribal groups just happen to benefit from one of those orders than the other. The proxy wars between liberal and communist worlds killed tens of millions. Yeah, Communism definitely. is hands down the worst political system in history by any objective measure. As we all know, the communist world deteriorated in the last few decades of the 20th century. Since communism was a materialist ideology, once that failed, there was no justification and the communist world self-imploded. China and Vietnam turned capitalist while the Communist Party maintained power. The former yeah. Soviet bloc deteriorated with the fall of the Soviet Empire and turned capitalist, if only crony versions. The traditional narrative goes that liberalism very clearly won the humanist wars of religion. Normally since Bulgaria being a... Um, okay, yeah, Due to yeah. its inherent okay. ideological advantages. But is that true? Are the humanist wars of religion even over and did liberalism even win? Liberalism didn't win since it's a better ideology. I am personally a liberal, <laughs> but liberalism Wait, won since the behemoth that is America happened to be liberal. This is an argument... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, so liberalism out of those three is not the best ideology. You make your conclusions from that, ladies and gentlemen. ...I've gotten from Azar Ghat and his masterful war in human civilization. The 20th century was the end of Western civilization's warring states period. We can look to the precedent of previous warring okay. states periods, which occur in every major civilization. In almost all of them, a state that we would call fascist today wins. You can see this with the Macedonians, Chin, Tsarist Russia, the Roman Empire, or the Maurians, all of which, if they existed today, we would define as fascist or incredibly aggressive militaristic monarchies like the Kaiser's Germany. You can see this in how fascist Germany and Japan fought far better per capita even versus liberal capitalist states. What? These very aggressive- Wait, 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 wait. what? Say that again. Per capita even- you can see this in how fascist Germany and Japan fought far better per capita even versus liberal capitalist states. Okay, These okay. I, I misheard that. I'm not going to say what I thought he said. Very aggressive autocratic states were frequently able to defeat democratic ones since their obsession with war and loyalty meant that they were able to conquer them. This is one of... But it, what? What? Hold on. The reasons why democracy is so rare over history, since democracies often get conquered. A profound difference between- But then he also, just a few minutes ago, said that the reason that they lost was because of their exact strength, right? If you look at the modern example, I'm not going to say it, right? But obviously it's out there that modern Russia, as the Russia-Ukraine war is still going on as of the time of recording this, 31 July 2023, is the modern fascist state. Right. And you can see that through its military aggression, um, you know, right. Obviously, it is not going to Russia's favor. Anyone. I think that's that's very clear to say, will Russia lose the war? I wish I had a I wish I had a, you know, a crystal ball to say yes or no. But clearly you have a state that one could argue has similar lineages to a fascist state, although that word gets thrown around way too often. Right. Although we can certainly say it's an authoritarian state that's very militaristic. And look at how well that's doing. Right. So I don't quite get what he's saying here by saying that a fascist state would win every time. 
between fascism and these previous autocratic states, and a big reason fascism failed while the others didn't, is that fascism was more directly racist and praised irrational aggression versus the other previous ones who praised duty and discipline more. This meant fascism alienated more- what? But then duty and discipline is also being praised in fascism, right? It's just to what? It's to the state potential allies and made more irrational decisions. Western civilization is the aberration, alongside with Republican Rome and kind of the Aztecs, where a democratic state unifies the civilization. In most cases, it's that the democratic state was on the edge of the map, expanded against tribal peoples, and then turned into the heart of that civilization to conquer it when it was bigger than everyone else. This is what happened with America, where due to a historical fluke, the wealthy island nation of England <laughs> was able to spread its values across a whole continent without those values changing since the Native Americans weren't able to put up much resistance. The I wouldn't say much resistance. They certainly put up a hell of a lot of resistance. They were also very much lied to and cheated out of a lot of the territory as well. So, uh, okay, I see what you're saying, but... Thus, creating a continent... So but the other thing, too, is like the majority of the... I mean, it's right here, right? The majority of the territory was, was purchased, right? Or it was just ceded, you know? That's kind of the main thing, right? Oregon being the most interesting one. I still don't fully understand why Britain gave that up. But nonetheless, right, a lot of it is not annexed through war. As nation with this it was, it was purchased by negotiation. Social institutions. Capitalist negotiations. of a will. small, wealthy island country. Another thing to consider is that Russia was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with America with Ooh, the Turkey horrifically inefficient system Oof. of communism. Imagine if Russia was literally any other political ideology. We would still see a massive Eurasian bloc, let alone possibly a Russian world with America isolationist. Yeah, I don't know about that one, but okay. The common wisdom goes that liberalism unanimously won the humanist wars of religion. From one perspective, this is totally true. Liberalism expanded massively as an ideology with the end of the- Peaked in 2010, I want to say. The Cold War, while fascism and communism are basically extinct. It's really dramatic that in a lot of ways, in 1970, less than a dozen countries around the world were liberal, with most of them clustered in northwestern Europe. In 2000, a majority of countries in the world were liberal, with yeah. liberalism becoming predominant in Europe, Latin America, and even making encroachments into Asia and Africa. However, from another point of view, liberalism is lost, at least in its original form. I have a theory that the ideology of the modern world is really managerialism and is a mixing of liberalism okay. and Marxism that bears very little resemblance to the actual liberalism of a hundred years ago. It's funny where lots of people will call me a fascist for making this video, but I perfectly fit the definition of a classical liberal. On the political compass, the people calling me fascist I hate the political compass. are closer to fascism than I am. The original liberalism stood for market freedom, freedom of speech, religion, and open market without any government intervention. What's often more shocking is what liberalism tolerated. Many liberals didn't believe in democracy, saying if you gave the mob the vote, it would destroy other freedoms. Most liberals were militaristic, racist, religious, and nationalist by today's standards. What a liberal used to be would be considered far right today. Paul Gottfried- Sure, but I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of the march of progress, right? Just as much as a liberal in the 1750s would be considered whatever term in 1900, right? As also being seen as rather backwards. And this video has gone on so long, one of my lights just died. So now we're only going with one light. As a book that covers this in greater depth. However, when you look at what liberalism stands for today, it's government intervention into every aspect of society. Uh, okay. Massive social engineering to intervene into literally every aspect of the society. This is hyper-American. Forced tolerance and multiculturalism, whether or not the public wants it. Illegalizing civilian firearms and gradually abolishing the nation and ethnicity itself. The great irony- Abolishing the ethnicity, oh boy. Ooh, watch your words there, buddy is that modern liberalism isn't just different from what it was originally. In many ways, it's the exact opposite. This video pulls very heavily from one of the greatest history books ever written, Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. Quigley, alongside the other greatest historians of the World War II era, such as William McNeil, James Burnham, or Amory Duryancourt, all talk about this same process, which they worried would destroy Western civilization. They called it the managerial revolution. 
The managerial revolution has been the introduction of college-educated bureaucrats into positions of power in government oh, and I think private I've heard enterprise. Talk about this before. An easy example is how, until very recently, the road to success was to get a good college degree. We've seen the amount of government bureaucrats go up by a factor of over 10 no. over the Western okay. world in the last 100 years. In European countries, in many cases, the population growth has been less than one-fifth of the growth in the bureaucracy. One of my friends has a great story about managerialism. He was talking to a friend who said, you've never experienced real freedom. My ancestors founded nine farms from Pennsylvania to Illinois in the 19th century and never signed paperwork from the government for it. You have to get the government to approve putting a mosquito fly on your back porch today. This line of logic explains how paperwork has imploded in the last few decades, how parents are too anxious to let their kids play outside, how everything has protocol. It's a process that my researcher Seamus refers to as the bureaucratization of morals. In this, the managers or experts try to get into every aspect of life so that they can use their expertise to fix it. No, I think American politics really boils down to urban versus rural. I don't think it's college educated versus non-college educated. The reality is they know nothing about how industries or spheres of life they don't deal with on a personal basis operate and also push their class. Again, like the left supports replacing non-college educated policemen with college educated social workers. Okay, let's, let's power through this here, every ladies and gentlemen. This view wants humans to be as lazy, degenerate, or divided as possible so that the managers can manage more of their lives. It actively dislikes human agency and things done implicitly through culture, which it wants to destroy to replace with systematic procedure. The government wants to destroy your culture, ladies and gentlemen. The modern world is a combination of the autistic masculine and the hysterical feminine. What ended up happening with fascism's defeat is that liberalism and Marxism coalesced together while removing the what? elements of fascism that were connected to the basic human condition, what? such as the nation, honor, and the vitality of life. The Wait, similar is he proposing that after, after fascism and communism were destroyed, they merged forces in the form of government bureaucracy? That's, that's a hell of a hypothesis. The parity between liberalism and communism, which fascism left out, is this kind of scientific managerial view of the world. And with the defeat of fascism, appeals to things like intuition, passion, and genetics became totally taboo, even though those are things that we need. And we ended up in a place where we can't argue for the value of things like the nation, sex, culture, or anything else that every other era in history would- What do you mean? All people do is argue about this stuff. What do you mean you can't? This is the thing that drives me up the wall about like the modern right, if you will. It drives me up the wall when they say like, we can't do this. And yet they base their entire careers <laughs> off doing that exact thing view as like, completely obvious nuts like i'm not allowed to criticize people it's like you're, you're doing it right now because the unified factor between liberalism and communism was autistic myopia what we should what? have done and what a reasonable society would have done is to develop a list of principles around which we should organize our society however because we live in a society of that's, that's that's what's done though it's already mechanical binary choices people just thought the nazis are evil let's be the opposite of the nazis but whenever you push something as far as you can it results in silliness and evil and we've gone too far in the other direction from the nazis because we have no appeal to anything else in our moral code fascism's base what that is crazy sentence man that was a crazy sentence this and survival is ugly but it's a really interesting symbol by the way that's the uh the flag I got here. So what I find interesting about it is that very quickly, um, I went to the, the SPU, right? So they have the Labor Day parade here in Austria. And I went there just to go check it out and see what's up. The KPU, that was like the most pathetic thing ever. The Communist Party of Austria. Oh boy. Anyways, um, what's interesting is actually that the Social Democratic Party, which is like your center left party for Austrian politics, right? For American politics, it would be different just as for Canadian, but they actually use this symbol still. And it's because of the historical connotations of it, of it being um, obviously the symbols of the left pre the Austro-fascist period. I thought it was kind of cool.
it's also realistic. And with its removal, our society lost any ability to appeal to national survival. I think the problem is, is that like we're talking about fighting fascism in 2023, right? Like we need new words. We need new ideologies other than just communism and fascism so that we can be against something, right? It's just so ridiculous. It's like, you're a communist, you're a fascist. I don't know. Boggles my mind. Instead, to be the opposite of fascism, our cultures are committing what fundamentally amounts to suicide. This is how liberalism and communism fused. This ideology is intellectually Marxist, which is why everything... Again, oh. Thing is based around studying oppression today. A liberal academia would constantly be talking about how amazing the Magna Carta and American Revolution were, or praising Adam Smith, called Whiggish history. You can also tell its Marxist foundations because there's been no analysis of the errors of Marxism over the last couple decades, even though it's killed more people than any other ideology in history combined. However, through its procedures, it's liberal. And Again, it's, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> we still treat it like a cousin who totaled our car by accident who means well. That's kind of funny, actually. I mean, again, it really depends on where you are, right? Like, you go to Romania, uh, you know, you go to Bulgaria, and you do not get the same treatment. Because, again, it's, it's also, I don't know, it's also online. This is also online individuals to do whatever they want while telling them they have no agency and need because i mean the, the thing is is like okay you take some left-wing political figure in america right and you just paint her say well she's a communist right you paint that you take the right 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 wing political figure and you say he's a fascist or she's a fascist right and it's just easy it's like it's like snacks right it's like snack ideologies that you can just look at and point and go oh well she's that and then you're fill your head in with the rest of whatever you think it is it's just such a black and white view of everything you know the experts to save them in this manner liberalism as it switched from being sponsored by the merchant classes to the bureaucracy lost any connection but how is it not like bureaucracy does not generate any sort of income right it doesn't generate productivity like we still live in a free market capitalist society. What? ...to what it was. The through line for liberalism was a tolerance of individual action or freedom. However, this moved from freedom from things, such as freedom from an oppressor. Like, dude. <laughs> like, this is just this is just right-wing stuff. Like, it's just like, yeah, 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 whatever. Freedom of responsibility, government hates everything, welfare, blah, 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 blah of government or for certain liberties to freedom you can abort the kids like oh, bro, come on. to do things or to live whatever kind of life you want it took liberalism's permissiveness so much so that it eroded the entire cultural foundations of society in all great dramas none of the people who initiated the drama survived to the end with some random <laughs> characters that show up at the end winning this is how most Shakespeare's plays are written as it was with the Greeks. The drama exists to show how the tragic flaw of the characters, which is always connected to their greatest strength, eventually brings them down. The humanist wars of religion, in this sense, is a perfect tragedy. One of the things I find shocking today is almost no one is proud of being a traditional liberal. The term liberal has been co-opted and become completely synonymous well, in America for leftist. Yeah, wh why do you think that happened? It happened from the right wing that then wants to paint liberals, which there is obviously tons of, of center-left people all over the world and in the United States and say that they're all leftists. And then you have the opposite side of the coin where you have tons of center-right people in the United States or in the world that then crazy people on the left will go, they're all fascists. Like, hello? or Marxist descendant philosophy. On the American right, the vast majority will identify as Christian before anything else. You almost never uh, okay. hear someone appeal to traditional liberal values today. This is incredibly- What do you mean? It's like, oh, okay, whatever. It's strange given just 20 years ago, liberalism here. was universally seen as the ideology that ruled the world and the future, as Francis Fukuyama talks about in his book, The End of History. Hour Another part minutes. of the drama of life is that when one chapter of history concludes, it stops being relevant and the world is entering a completely different story. This is what has occurred today. The reason liberalism in its victory failed is fundamentally the same reason I don't think it failed at all. All the okay. other humanist religions failed. That the technological project is fundamentally false.
The outside world often shows the manifestations of our subconscious as we collectively build worlds modeled upon how our minds operate. Carl Jung said that the Iron Curtain was symbolic for how the modern world splits itself off from intuition, religion, and uses science for tunnel visions. Once the Iron Curtain fell, so did the other side of it. The technological project looked feasible in the era of the most rapid, insane population growth ever. Thus, there was an idea that it could go on forever and that humans had really cracked the code. The 20th century is in some ways a breath of fresh air from the rest of history, which is a cynical balance of war conflicts thousands of year old religions, aristocracies, but the 20th century's order isn't sustainable either. The developed world achieved a wealth that was completely unimaginable to any society before. Most lived in a utopia without real crime, disease, filth, poverty, or war. With all of that, they were still miserable. More so than even before, actually. The technological project worked only to realize that it was all a lie. Life had to mean more than the physical world and material things. At the same time, morals, the birth rate, art, culture, and the rest collapsed. The world we stare down is one where the technological project has burned social institutions to the point where most people feel empty and numb. In the process, the family, the nation, community, religion, morality, art, philosophy have been lost. So much of their societies are depressed to the point of committing suicide. The idea of the humanist wars of religion from which I made this video comes from Yuval Noah Harari's book Sapiens, oh, been and he talks about that, how we are the only age in history to live without a story, and that the liberal story defeated the others in the humanist wars of religion, but now we don't believe that anymore, and so we just sit in complete shock, unable to process the world. Did any of you notice earlier in the video where I talked about what things each of the humanist ideologies needed to balance themselves out to be successful? And for each of them in their own separate ways, it was that they needed to actually be a religion rather than an ideology. This is because the technological project puts too much weight on human ability, which humans are just incapable of building a utopia, and they need grounding from something greater than merely human initiative. The lives my generation face are the opposite okay. of those of the technological revolution. It will see incredibly rapid population collapse. I think that's the first time he said that the population will actually... Wait, what? The world's population will have by 20... The degeneration of social structure in a world of less every year rather than more. In this world, the technological scheme will seem like a bitter joke from a last time. In an age of decline, inequality, and the need to boost the birth rate, things the rest of history understand very well. Religion, whether... Into being rural and religious since they will breed and to avoid social collapse of old or new varieties will suddenly look much more appealing. You know, the Old Testament was right. The story of the world is mankind leaving God when it's doing well and then begging to have him back when things get worse every time. Well, if there's nothing that doesn't sum up the ideology better than that, I don't know what is. Thank you very much for joining me on that one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been an hour, 11 minutes. Leave a comment down below if you made it this far. Peter, I know you made it this far. Leave a comment down below. I'm always happy to discuss with you guys. Whew. That's a long one. These, these videos are pretty heavy. So until next time, see you guys in the next one. Thank you very much again. Leave a comment down below. Let's talk there. Take care.